Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. I'm Salty Octopus, and today I'm joined by Christus, who is one of the lead developers on Wrath Aeon of Ruin. He's agreed to sit down with me today and chat a little bit about the game. So, Christus, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate having you on. Thank you. Um, appreciate being brought on. All right, well, let's talk about you a little bit, you know, the way that these interviews work, as I chat about you a little bit, and then we'll chat about you know, the project itself. So getting to know you a little bit, what are some games that shaped your foundation as a gamer growing up? And can you point to one particular game that inspired you to become a game developer? I think uh, first, uh, the game that really sets that, uh, takes that place is Castlevania for the NES. Uh, I remember playing that the first time and the first thing I did when I got home because we didn't have our own, own NES, uh, I sat down and started drawing uh, ideas for my very derivative Castlevania-like game that I wanted to make myself. So I started my design document uh, as a, I can't remember how old I was, maybe 10 years old or something. Castlevania, uh, of course I didn't have any way to make a game back then, so it was, ended up making a bunch of, uh, what's it called, uh, tabletop games instead. Okay. Well, what about Quake? I know that you obviously have worked on Wrath, and then you yourself have a game called Doombringer, so that's very Quake-inspired. Um, was Quake a, a part of uh, your life growing up? Yeah, I mean, um, when I, I had quite the journey from uh, that first NES game uh, experience to when I got in with uh, PC games. Uh, but uh, Doom was what a caught my attention for real or one of them and of course what by the time quake came out you were quite excited for the next game by the people who made doom uh, so but it didn't grab me the mu as much as doom did and uh, while i do appreciate it a lot it has never been one of my favorites to be honest it's uh i still play it sometimes in multiplayer i went to quake land in January, for instance, here in Stockholm, uh, which was a lot of fun meeting uh, people. But yeah, it's a uh, Quake has been mostly for multiplayer for me, whereas Doom has been the single player and multiplayer. Awesome. Well, going back into your video game development experience, what's your professional background? Are you self-taught? Are you formally educated? And how long have you worked in the video game industry? So I'm actually fairly recent to the game industry, as it were. Uh, I started working with the Doom engine and anything that I could tinker with back in the 90s. Uh, and then uh, that's kind of how I trundled along. I did uh, spend a couple of years at art school in the mid, around 2007, uh, while I was working on a Doom 3 mod as well, etc. Oh, so okay. it was actually quite long journey there uh, where I mostly did my own things. So eventually I felt like I had enough meat on my bones to start thinking about making my own game. So it was Doombringer that started that. And that's how I actually got the attention of uh, 3D Realms and Slipgate Ironworks to get be hired to work uh, as an animator on Wrath originally because I uh, unfortunately didn't have one for a while. Yeah, I know that the development cycle of Wrath has been a bit rocky, and that's something that I'd like to talk about here in a few minutes, but um, were you part of any of the mod teams? Like, you obviously were working on Doombringer, but I, I know a lot of the, the folks that worked on Wrath were part of various Quake modding teams and, and some of that stuff. Were you part of any of those groups, or did you just strictly come over because of your... Doombringer game. No, I was pretty much all Doombringer. The, I was on a mod team called Team Future in the uh, like for for Doom Three uh, from 2004 until 2010, where we were working on a mod called Doom Three Phobos. But I kind of got extremely burnt out on working on that mod. Uh, they started releasing, making releases for it like two years ago. <laughs> so. They had a long development story. But I was never really in the Quake community mm -hmm. modding scene. Uh, I worked 
with some friends on some Quake mods, but we never really actually released any of them before Doombringer. Uh, and generally I ended up, even the Team Future one was where I, together with someone else, started a pro pro project. I never, I very rarely joined a group uh, as a, without being the person that started it. Uh, because, uh, I don't know, I I like to do my own thing, I guess. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Doombringer, is that one built on Dark Places engine as well? Because I know obviously Wrath is. Mm. Yeah, Wrath is built on a version of Dark Places from 2014, whereas Doombringer is built on uh, Dark Places from, uh, well, uh, much, much more recent builds. Okay. Um, so, whereas Dark Places is, uh, well, Wrath is, uh, it actually has a few different rendering pipelines, but it's the one that's being used is OpenGL 2.1. Doombringer is using OpenGL 3 instead. So, there's plus a lot of bug fixes and stuff like that, improvements. So, when you just set out to make your very first game, which was Doombringer, what, what made you arrive at using the Dark Places engine when you you know, didn't sound like you had maybe as much Quake background, but you did go with the Quake engine. Yeah, so the thing about the Dark Places engine is that it's not really a Quake engine anymore. I mean, it has all the support for Quake formats and stuff, but it's more, um, apart from the programming language, which is a vastly developed uh, version of the Quake, Quake C programming format, it's uh, more of a Doom 3 Quake 3 style engine oh, in a okay. lot of ways. So, for instance, Wrath is using a Quake 3 model format and it uses Quake 3 map format stuff. So, it's not really Quake 1 format that is being used. Oh, uh, interesting. Okay. Which is why we can use the uh, modeling in uh, the map format, etc. in that way. Gotcha. Um, but, yeah, I knew. The reason was I knew the format uh, from my experience working, tinkering with the Quake engine and Quake 2 engine and Quake 3 engine, and from working for several years in the Doom 3 engine. Well, let's let's Dark. zip back over to Wrath. Um, mm. You told me that you originally were contracted there in, was it 2021 as an animator, right? I was contracted to do five animation sets as an animator. And then as development progressed, you started to wear very many hats and you were eventually hired full time, as you said. Can you kind of walk me through that process and tell me a bit about all the various things you contributed to the project? Yeah, so at first it was very like I had my full time job as a school teacher and I was also working on Doombringer and then Wrath came in at a third there. so. But it was only five animations that I figured, okay, that's not too big a task. I can do this. Uh, and so I did some animation work for them. And one, when I was working on animating the first boss, the Lady of Ascension, was basically when I was uh, when we were there was an open invitation to come visit the offices at the uh, 3D Realms Street Gate Ironworks. And I figured, okay. Sounds nice. I'll take a couple of weeks uh, of vacation and come over and do work there. I work at the office, feel how it is to be around like-minded individuals and stuff. And basically, at the same time, I was looking at uh, leaving my school teacher job to work as an animator for a motion capture company. And I kind of was in the running to get that job, but I also was then approached by uh, Slipgate uh, about working full time when they realized I was uh, looking for a different job. Uh, so basically I was a few months uh, as a contractor before I was uh, approached about how working full time. After that I basically started taking on more and more responsibility as, uh, as I was like kind of mindset that I was going to work full time on this anyway. So then I started picking up uh, modeling tasks. Uh, so I modeled the, uh, modeled and rigged and animated the uh, the little spider m monster that goes invisible. Oh yeah. And 
And when I first got here and started working full time, I made uh, skulls and uh, the maze of devastation. I can't ever remember what it's called. Devastation maze. Yeah, the the, the, the BFG weapon. weapon. The BFG yeah. weapon. Yeah, that's awesome. And then we needed someone to make uh, set dressing models for E2M1, the uh, the uh, Evan, uh, the Dunes map. I can't remember its, its <laughs> full name, to be honest, because it changed a few times. Uh, so I spent a, couple, a month uh, set dressing, the, uh, redoing the rock modeling on that, or in polishing that up. And, uh, then there was E2M2 that needed someone to level design it because it was half done, basically. And um, basically, okay, someone needs this. Okay, I'll I'll do that. That's yeah. kind of like my jam, anyway. Um, but I also realized there was a lot of other things that I needed to do. So, for instance, um, so I spent like six months making that while I also did other things, smaller tasks here and there. After that, it, it was I decided that I wouldn't spend time making levels for Wrath uh, anymore, and just focus on everything that uh, was that needed uh, my uh, experience, basically. For the people learning and listening about the video game industry, what what a lot of people don't realize is that a lot of the times you learn to wear a lot of different hats when you're working on a game. When I was working in the industry i was originally hired as a texture artist and by the mm. end of the time i was finished on that project i had been promoted to a level lead and i had people working with me like a modeler and a texture artist and it's just because i had taken on so many projects and you kind of as the project goes on throughout the years you just really find yourself advancing and taking on more and more roles as things need to get uh finished <laughs> Yeah, if you if you're interested in learning new things or trying new things, then it's the door is pretty much open a lot of the time to just. So what's can, your what's your official title now at Slipgate Ironworks? Uh, my official title on the current project that I'm working on is game design and lead UI uh, designer. Okay. And uh, are so, you so? Do you work? You don't work remotely. You work at a studio then. Yeah, I work at the office in Denmark. Uh, I, I'm uh, one of those people that definitely don't want to work from home because mm -hmm. then I would, uh, I would ruin my home for me, basically. Yeah, I feel uh, the same way with you. Uh, yeah. So, Kill and Pixel Games, then, uh, which was the studio, obviously, 3D Realm Slipgate Ironworks was was working in tandem. Is that a studio that is remote workers? Because I know. Um, like Recky, uh, he, he's a coder. Um, were those people remoting in from other parts of the world to get this project done? So the, the labeling on the game I'm, of who made it is kind of confusing to me, mm -hmm. to be honest, because I don't know anyone other than Jeremiah who works for Kill Pixel Studio. Uh, so everyone who worked on Wrath at least for the last few years, they were hired by either 3D Realms or by uh, Slipgate Ironworks as either contracted workers to do, you know, like uh, freelance uh, individual tasks or as full-time employees. Gotcha. Um, and uh, so is it a mixture but, of on-site and off-site people? Yeah, well, there were a mixture of on-site and off-site people that had worked on it. Yes, uh, but for the time that I spent on Wrath, it was pretty much only me that I was full time on Wrath, working from the office. Gotcha. Uh, there was were some uh, people uh, that were full time but were not on site. I think Wrath, at least you know on Steam and throughout the boomer shooter community, it kind of became infamously known for how long it was stuck in early access and was kind of stuck in that development hell cycle. Um, yeah. Could you explain a little bit about why that was the case and what were some of the major challenges the studio had to face to push Wrath towards its final release? There's a lot of things that played into that, right? I think the biggest issue is that you using a old tech that the people who were used to using that tech aren't used to using it anymore. 
we had Chuck Jones on, for instance, uh, who had worked on Half-Life back in the day. Uh, and he did some great work. He made the second boss model, for instance. But I don't think he really remembered how the tech worked uh, compared to someone who works with it every day, right? And uh, just getting the right person for the for the task was tricky. And most people who are working with the Doom Quake 1 engine work with Quake 1 formats as well. So there was also that kind of uh, experience uh, gap there a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, people who are really good are usually also really busy. Uh, so it's hard to, you know, you have to find them in the right moment in time to, to be available. And uh, uh, yeah, the, the pool gets smaller and smaller of finding. Uh, and of course, there was also the aspect of working on it. Uh, a lot of it was worked on in the free time of people, similar to how I started with it. It was something I did as a side project to my side project. Yeah. Kind of thing. Okay. Um, there's a lot of uh, mistakes made and uh, people get burnt out. Um, I don't know all the details, of course, since I was one quite late to join. I, anything I heard, I take with a grain of salt because I wasn't there, uh, kind of thing, you know. Yeah, that but makes t t total sense. Making games is hard, though. It so. is. <laughs> and I, and I, that's one thing that I like to to try to talk about in these interviews is just, you know, what, what people are doing is hard and, you know, the average gamer doesn't understand that. And, yeah. um, well, you know, just to wrap that thought up, did you guys feel, you know, a lot of stress and pressure to get this game out the door or how'd you guys feel when it was done? Like what was kind of that process once, once you were kind of wrapping that up? I worked on Wrath until October this year when we went into content lock. That was when the uh, we were not adding more to the game. We're just gonna polish what's left, uh, what's done, right? And after that, I pretty much left the project instantly to work on the next project. Uh, whereas, well, while the team was left to do the final polishing on things that weren't polished, etc. Yeah, and I felt like. <sighs> I posted a gif of Frodo after the ring was destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect. Uh, because that's kind of how I felt. It was like a quite quite the marathon. I don't the remember I... the taste of food, Christus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. Last week on Wrath, I think I worked... Uh, uh, well, I know Recky worked like a long quite long hours to make sure that uh, what what we had left to do got done. Uh, it was unfortunate, but at least we made it. You guys got it done. Listen, I, you know, yeah, I wrote a very favorable review for the game. I really thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, I think it's, for me, for me, I think it's right up there with like a medieval and dusk and some of these really amazing games that have been coming out in the last couple of years so i think you guys have done one heck of a job um and so i want to transition a little bit to talking about the game um some of the interesting mechanics you guys kind of threw in there and the first i wanted to talk about was the soul tether save system it reminded me of daikatana and the save mm. gyms and i guess my my question is what's the design philosophy behind the save system and why did you guys decide to go with that in the end, um, especially when Daikatana is historically so disliked? Um, I can't really think of another game in the genre that uses a system like that, so can you speak to that at all? Well, that was very early. I remember we had a discussion about it on Doom World forums back when Jeremiah showed off the game there originally in like 19, 2019 or 2018 or something. There was a guy there who was very upset about this uh, save game system being there, called it a bug uh, and not a feature. Uh, I'm, I get why people may be frustrated with it. Personally, I don't think that's a problem at all. I think uh, the reason people are upset with something like that in Daikatana is if they already have a sour mind about the game, making it even more uh, pushing that uh, frustration 
it's gonna uh, be even more frustrating, right? And then you're gonna hate it. It's sort of like in uh, a game like Dark Souls, where you have uh, things that are pushing your, uh, pushing you around a bit. Like it could be very frustrating if it's done incorrectly, or if the game is not treating you well. Uh, but I think uh, the system itself is. Uh, I don't think it's a problem with the system uh, to have some sort of thought that I probably shouldn't save every. You know every step I take uh, because it it does add a little bit of extra tension uh, to not have unlimited savings. Yeah, uh, I agree. I I found myself strategizing on when to use the save and when not to. And one thing that I think was very balanced about your guys's game is you you offered just enough saves to get us where we needed to go, but not too few like in Dai Katana, which was what was really frustrating about that game. And then, of course, you had the altars. You could save that as well, which, which were really helpful. So I think it was balanced well. I thought it was interesting, so I just wanted to kind of... To be honest, when I play the game, I have like a shit ton of extra save. Uh, I have like 50 saves after a while or something uh, that I can use. <laughs> because, yeah, uh, I had a lot too at the end. You get uh, so especially when you played the game so much as you have when you're developing it. You you know where everything is, so you don't have to save nearly mm -hmm. as much as you may have to otherwise. Makes sense. It, and that's also a trap for a lot of developers, right? You don't you forget how, how well you know the game, so you end up making it more frustrating than it needs to be. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting point to think about, for sure. Well, another interesting mechanic I wanted to talk about was the artifact system where for those who haven't played the game, you basically have an inventory full of power-ups. And I found myself using a bunch of them, and some a lot more than others. And at times, just because it was in the inventory and I'm just in the middle of a fight, I would just completely forget to use them. So I guess similar to my question before, I just wanted to kind of know about this design choice and why it was made versus a more traditional power-up system where you just pick up, you know, invisibility and now you're invisible. Yeah. That was also before I was on, but we had some discussions about it because I wanted it to be different, to be honest. I wanted you to be able to use multiple power-ups at the same time. Uh, because uh, I come from, I played a lot of Heretic and Hexen back in the day. Uh, actually made a couple of mods for Hexen and Heretic as well. And I just loved uh, being able to mix and match them. like create synergy between the power-ups and I think some of the power-ups in Wrath would have been working really well but I did not win that argument. <laughs> There's also some technical, uh, visual technical reasons why they didn't have that. But uh, I think there's a benefit to be able to like have a power-up in your pocket because it gives you a sense of uh, that power trip of being able to become a power powerful at your own uh, at your own leisure rather than uh, the other problem that can arise well like, there's problem with any system really but like uh, if you have a quad damage in an arena and the player kills all the monsters before they find the quad damage then they don't get to use the quad damage for anything useful uh, right so uh, i think uh, also it makes it's more fun to find secrets if there's a, if you can like bolster your backpack with fun things. Uh, carrying a power up in your pocket, I think, is helpful to make you feel more powerful. The secret hunting, uh, though, going back to that thought, the secret hunting and the map design of your guys' game was next level, man. I was. I was so enjoying how big and vast those maps were and just looking for every nook and cranny. I spent a lot of time searching out every secret. It was it was great. Yeah, I think uh, there's two sides of that coin, right? If you enjoy looking for secrets, you're going to have a lot of fun. But if you just want to go to the exit, then, then you're going to run into some problems here and there. Uh, yeah. But you can't please everyone. You're gonna have have to make sure that the game is the way you want it to be. I'm a big fan of big levels. Yeah, I mean, as as a Doom player, you've you've got to be right, and that's that's kind of what's my next question is is you know Doom and Doom Two have massive maps and lots of exploration, and so I saw a ton of influences in your game. You know, as I was playing, 
Um, mm-hmm. I don't think you can really create a throwback shooter game without having those influences shine through. And so I guess my question is, is there amongst the team, is there a conscious effort in the department, the art department, to make sure that the people playing the game are catching the influences, or, or are you guys trying to make it more subtle? You know, for example, like the fleshy levels with the eyeballs, like that made me really think of some of the hell maps from Doom 2, so I was just kind of curious about, about that. No, we never really talked about it that way. It was always about uh, what would make, uh, what can we do with the resources we have? and what uh, what will be a good way to communicate what we want to happen to the player. I mean, we always have those inspirations in the back of our mind, right? The things that we liked from other games. And you can never really make a game without having, thing, having uh, your inspirations uh, uh, guide you. The, the tricky part is to make the inspirations not just be tacked on things that you tape together into some sort of a Frankenstein's monster or a game, but right. something that has a meaningful uh, reimagining of things that you've seen before. But also like just knowing what the game is you want to make is, and not tape, make excuses for it, basically. Well, uh, I thought it was cool. I, th- I saw a lot hmm. of Doom, a lot of Quake, a lot of Hexen, a lot of Daikatana. So it was, it was a good mix and mash of yeah. a lot of influences intended or not so um well talking about a little bit um about possible future content i understand if you're under a you know non-disclosure you can't talk about this but i'll ask the question anyways um you know i i think early on multiplayer was discussed um mm. is there any chance of seeing that in the future and then the other question is about future patches or maybe even dlc support can you speak to any of that? I don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> I enough. don't know if I can speak uh, of the things the little I do know, but uh, yeah, with the, as far as I know, there are no plans of DLC right now. Uh, and I think a lot of people who worked on the project is probably uh, it's been a long, long grind for a lot of people, right? But I, I don't want to set put words into anyone's mouth for sure uh, there's obviously gonna be this game is open source so anyone can take the source and run with it and add those things unfortunately i don't think the multiplayer is gonna be done by a slipgate at least uh, mm, or okay. three three D realms right now and the problem with multiplayer also is that it's uh, unless you're making a very big game, it's not super worth the time to invest in it, to make it uh, playable. Uh, you can make a very simple multiplayer, of course, which uh, don't really have the, all the work put into it to work over uh, vast, vast uh, ranges, like uh, 150 ping and stuff like that. Something I learned when I was working on Doombringer is that maintaining both single player and multiplayer is a lot more work than people expe- expect it to be. <laughs> well, I uh, I've played Doombringer multiplayer. I've I've played a decent amount of it actually against bots. Um, I want to find some real people to to play against at some point, but um, I haven't touched the single player yet. So I'm gonna have to have you back on. Um, so we can talk about that more when I've familiarized myself more with, with your with your other game. So that'd be that'd be really fun to talk about uh, down I the road. I look forward to that. Well, do you have any more closing thoughts about uh, Wrath or, or anything else? I'm kind of just to put you on the spot here. It's okay if you don't, but I'm, I'm at the end of my questions. So unless you have anything mm. else to add, that's kind of it. Uh, Wrath and I had a pretty funny situation because it was the first boomer shooter revival game that i was really interested in um of course if you can see how i would have done it differently because i made doombringer <laughs> while it was a lot of frustration and ty- uh, long nights uh, i'm glad i uh, i'm glad i was part of the process uh, it became uh, i'm i'm uh, proud of what we accomplished with it forgot almost forgot to say 
when you asked earlier about how it was from us working on it and uh, if we were rushed to deliver it, I think the biggest thing that really mattered to us was uh, how how angry people were with us, uh, and we kept keeping each other uh, spirit up by saying things like, oh, "Don't worry, they'll they'll understand when they see it," uh, because yeah, I, people were calling us scammers and stuff like that, and pretending saying that we didn't work on the game and uh, <laughs> yeah, kind of harsh uh, to reality to deal with when uh, when you're working very hard to finish something and people are very upset with you so uh. well i'm glad you guys were able to persevere through all of that because i know like you said it was a very long road but um, myself and several other youtube reviewers and other game reviewers and people that i've seen through steam and stuff as well every, a lot of people are speaking very favorably about wrath so uh, I, I think you guys did the job, so... Um, I appreciate it. Uh, it was, uh, I learned a lot from it, uh, and that is always the most important to me in the end. Yeah, well, for your first but, ever industry gig, that was, uh, that was pretty, probably quite the road for you, quite the learning experience, so I imagine that was uh, fun at times, hard at times, frustrating at times, yeah. but... Good experience all, in the all end. The all the feelings. All the feelings. <laughs> <laughs> like you said, and I'll, I'll put this up there uh, in the in the video. Frodo. <laughs> Sam, I don't taste the, remember the taste of food. Uh, yep. I think that's Very a good much. place to, to end the interview. So, uh, Christus, thanks again so much for speaking with me today. And um, I look forward to chatting with you down the road with uh, Doombringer. Keep an eye out for episode two. All right, everybody. That concludes the interview with Christus of Slipgate Ironworks, 3D Realms, creators of Wrath, Aeon of Ruin. If you haven't played it yet, I do recommend checking it out on Steam. And I do have a review of the game up on my channel right now. So please go check that out if you're interested. Please let me know what you thought of this interview in the comments below. These interviews are sometimes pretty tough to get. So if you guys are enjoying them, please let me know and I will keep trying to make them happen. With that said, please also don't forget to subscribe to the channel, share with your friends, but most importantly, thank you so much for watching. I'm Salty Octopus, and I will see you next time. Happy fragging!